Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text has been read, Luke 10. Now, our pastor preached a very good sermon on this a couple of Sundays ago, but as he did so, I was reminded of something I did several years ago, and that is to take a parable and look at it in many different ways rather than the customary way. Now, some of you were here a few years ago when we preached on the parable of the so-called prodigal son. We divided into ten different parables, like the parable of the awaiting father, the parable of the fatted calf, the parable of the great teacher, so forth and so on. Tonight we look at the parable of the road to Jericho. The road between Jerusalem and Jericho was uninhabited basically, it was very rugged, and it was well known to be filled with bandits. When Jesus was speaking to these people a long time ago, they knew this road and they knew what he said was true. Could have happened several times. Maybe even this was a real case, we do not know. Anyhow, if it were not true, that lawyer who liked to trick Jesus would have said, hey, that's preposterous. Everybody knows the road is safe. Well, the idea came to me that this man traveled alone. Perhaps he should not have done that. We go back to Jesus when he was eight years old, and what do we know? He came with a group of people as the custom was. He went back. Oh, he didn't go back with the custom, with the crowd. You remember that Mary and Joseph thought he was there, and then they looked around in their friends and their circle of travelers. Oh, no. So they had to go back to get him. Now, Another thing about this man, obviously he went first and he went by himself and that may have been the most dangerous time. What does the Bible say about doing things alone? Among other things, there is wisdom in the counsel of many. Sometimes we get a thought in our mind and we come up with a conclusion and it's stupid. It's crazy. If we would have talked with other people, perhaps they would have said, hey, wait a minute, you're forgetting this, and oh yeah, what I was, my conclusion was entirely wrong. College professors will write a paper, and among their peers they'll discuss it, and sometimes it will be accepted, sometimes it will be rejected, sometimes it's put to further study. Likewise with us pastors, we meet in circuit meetings every month, and sometimes somebody will write a paper, maybe they saw another church doing something, or they read something in the Bible and wasn't thoroughly explained by our church, and so they developed some thoughts. And so we go ahead and we discuss it amongst ourselves to come up with a proper conclusion. Lay people likewise. You go to this church or that church, you attend a revival somewhere, so your friend says, come on, we're going to have a revival at our church, and you don't know how to get out of it, and so you come along and you come back and you say, woo, uh, was this right? And you can talk with other people and find out what the Bible says, there is wisdom in the counsel of many. Now, there's also something, it's a very strange word for us, it's called worry. Have you ever worried about something? <laughs> Sometimes we worry about it, we keep it to ourselves, and we find out that, wow, if I had shared that with somebody, they'd have said, hey, you're way off base. That is never going to happen. Let me give you an illustration from a close friend of mine now in heaven. Pastor Oscar Horn moved into my congregation as a retired pastor, we, got, we became close friends. As a matter of fact, we were close before he retired and came to me. He told us of a time, by the way, he also baptized one of the Stover children, Linda, the daughter. The, uh, maybe Tony or somebody would say the fair-haired one. I don't know if anybody has favorites or not. But anyhow, <laughs> Pastor Horn was raised out in the country in Texas where they had a path. Do you know what a path is? Another word for it is outhouse. <laughs> so Harry came to Lutheran Prep School in Austin, Texas. And he has a room there. And he goes into this room and it has these porcelain bowls. 
What in the world are those, he thought. And then it had a chain hanging down from the ceiling. What is that, he said. And he pulled it, and to quote Pastor Horn, it made the God-awfulest noise. I was so afraid I had broken something, I ran out and I hid for the night. <laughs> Now, he was worried about something that was completely unnecessary, if he only would have known. Not too long ago, about a year or so ago, I had some chest pains, and I'm not going to say I was worried, but I was concerned. Patty was too. We went to the hospital, and long and short, nothing. Oh, in 1971, I went to the emergency four times in a row with chest pains. My verdict gonna die. <laughs> the doctors, you're allergic, they finally figured out to coffee. Prescription, don't drink anymore. But I was worried for the time being. Going alone, two heads are better than one, which you have. Sometimes you'll try something and you fail and you try, maybe even bust a thumb or something else. And somebody else says, oh gosh, you're doing it again all wrong. If you had only gone to somebody else and got some advice, you wouldn't have made that mistake. There is wisdom in the counsel of many. And then there is the go-it-alone religion. These people don't go to church. They don't have to. They're pretty good the way that they already are. They, they know that they're not perfect. But they're better than a lot of people, even those who go to church all the time, like some of you, they're better than you. Yeah, they'll tell you that. At least they will behind your back, maybe not to your face, I don't know. Now, they can say along with the Pharisee, God, I thank thee that I'm out as other people, this, that, and the other. And then they can name their worst person that they really detest <laughs> and say, and better than that person. As Christians, we can't do it, but with the go it alone religion, you can do it if you want to. Now, there's a lot of self-help religions. These adherents attend some kind of a church, and they go to public worship. But when it's all said and done, there's only two religions in the whole world, as Pastor has told us time and again. The one religion depends on Jesus Christ alone. The other religions depend on maybe Muhammad or Buddha or this or that or even Jesus. But you got to do this, that, and the other to put it to, to make yourself right. You can't trust that Jesus did it all by himself. Now, when I was a little boy, I used to attend revivals and things like that. And Sunday night was always a revival of some kind. And invariably, I would hear this. And you, some of you heard it. All right, we've preached our sermon. I want you to come forward now. Tear up your cigarettes and your playing cards. Pour out your beer and your wine and your whiskey. And come forward and give your hand to the preacher and your heart to God. Now I wondered, how many people bring cigarettes and playing cards to church? <laughs> and, and how many bring beer and wine and whiskey to church? But that was the altar call over and over and over again. It's what you got to do in order to make yourself right with God. The other day I was listening to a very well-spoken preacher in Knoxville, one of the mainline churches, and he gave a very interesting message on this same text, the Good Samaritan. And I really remember his illustration there. I won't use his words, but this lady came to church. She was unkempt, she was dirty, and she was smelling. I won't say exactly how he said it, but if you... Well, I'll boil it down to, as best I can, a baby with a diaper yeah. uh, smells, <laughs> and this woman did too. So the members took her to the river and cleaned her up and fixed her all up and set her on her way again. And the idea was, this was a good thing to do, and if you want to please Jesus, you've got to do these things. I didn't hear any gospel. I didn't hear that Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins and therefore enables us to do these things, just that you got to do the good things to please God. Then, of course, we all are experienced to this. There are the funeral messages. 
and somehow or another we got to preach these people into heaven now if they haven't been faithful in church and the family is there morning a pastor can't say ah oh, sam's dead gone to hell <laughs> so you got to prove that he was a real good man and that he earned his way into heaven we heard one of those messages not too long ago and i've heard two or three from that same pastor where Gosh, if you would just be as good as this person, you'd go to heaven too. Jesus, the cross, the death, the rest, no. We don't want to talk about that in some sermons. True Christianity is a go-it-alone religion. First of all, it took Jesus. He took our sins to the cross and paid for them in full. His blood covers up our sins and makes us righteous with God. This Him. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Or I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only Thee, trusting Thee for full salvation, great and free. And then there's this word. Let us not forsake the assembling together of ourselves, as is the custom of some, but all the more, as you see the day is drawing near. And doesn't it look like with the situations we see in the world, the day is drawing near. And how about this Bible verse? In the midst of the great congregation, I will praise thee, O Lord. The great congregation means people are there, and we're not going it alone. We're going in there with the people. Jesus said, what, what's the name of the sermon again? Good Samaritan. The what? The Good Samaritan. The path. The, no. the path, the road alone. The oh. road to Jerusalem. <laughs> Jesus talked about a road. There is a road that is broad and wide, and many people travel upon it. There's another road that is straight and narrow, and it leads to salvation, and just be a few people who find it. You and I cannot find that road by ourselves. Luther put it this way, I believe that I cannot believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to Him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel. Thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit has brought us into this Holy Christian Church, and you and I are traveling on that road, and that road invariably leads to the place we call our congregation. For brothers and sisters who know us, they weep with us when we're sad, they comfort us when we're feeling low, and they rejoice with us when we have something to celebrate. And they join us, as Jesus says to us, Come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And we assemble here together, not by ourselves, but as a group. And Jesus says, Take eat. This is my body. Take drink. This is my blood. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And we say, Amen. Amen.